Hello, everybody. So as incoming co-director of the Griswold Center for Economic Policy Studies, I just wanted to extend a warm welcome to everyone on behalf of Ileana Kuziemko and myself. And it's wonderful to see so many um, of our steering committee members and advisory board members here on the meeting today. Um, as you all know, the COVID pandemic has been a major macroeconomic shock, uh, raising a whole set of challenging issues in both the short run and the long term, including the outlook for inflation, implications for macro policy more broadly, and the future organization of work, among others. And the Griswold Center is planning a whole series of public and member events addressing these issues, including our upcoming full symposium on the post-pandemic labor market. But today we have a stellar roundtable on inflation uh, featuring Lord Mervyn King, the Alan Greenspan Professor of Economics and Professor of Economics and Law at the NYU Stern School of Business and the School of Law and former governor of the Bank of England. And Paul Krugman, Distinguished Professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center, Emeritus Faculty here at Princeton, um, and of course, op-ed columnist for the New York Times and Nobel Laureate for his research on trade and economic geography. And the discussion is going to be moderated by the Griswold Center's senior research scholar and former president of the New York Fed, uh, Bill Dudley. And um, as always uh, on these events, you know, please feel free to include your questions in the chat and collect them. We'll be monitoring the chat and collecting questions uh, for the end of the discussion. So we'd really encourage you uh, to submit those uh, to try to make this as interactive uh, as possible. And so without further ado, I'll now hand over to Bill Dudley, who's going to moderate today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, this is, we have an absolute great topic. It could not be more timely. Do we have an inflation problem? Inflation has gone up higher for longer, and it's probably going to reside, re go down, back down more slowly than what people had earlier anticipated. And we have two uh, great people to address this question. It's not often that I get to work at the same moment with a Lord and a Nobel Laureate, but that's what we have today in Lord Mervyn King and uh, Professor Paul uh, Krugman. Um, so why don't we start, what, what we're gonna do today is uh, we're gonna give the, each of, each of uh, our speakers about 10 minutes to, to make some remarks about inflation. Then I'll uh, interrogate them uh, in a very kind way after that for a few minutes. And then we'll open up to the audience for questions. So let's start with uh, Lord King. Mervyn, the floor is yours. Well, Bill, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to join you and Paul and Stephen and everyone else on this webinar. The question you've given us is, do we have an inflation problem? And I interpret that to be really about the medium term because we clearly have inflation, uh, not just in the US, but around the world, inflation is well above where we would like it to be. And only this morning, we learned that in the US, producer prices were rising at an annual rate of 8.3%. So in a sense, we do have inflation. Now, the... I don't think I don't, the, the basic summary of what I want to say is that I don't think we should become too concerned about the actual behavior of inflation so far, because as the Fed has judged and other central banks have judged, it is true that a good deal of the recent increase in inflation is likely to be transitory. But the fact that some, or indeed even perhaps most of the increase in inflation is transitory is not really a comforting answer because not all of it may be. I don't want to make a forecast, but it, what is very clear is that whatever measure of inflation you look at, inflation has picked up. The, the Fed prefers to look at core CPE inflation. And if you were to plot a chart of it over the past 10 years, what is remarkable are two things that stand out. First, that over the past decade, inflation, core inflation has moved between one and 2% a year. It's hardly ever moved beyond that range. It certainly did not ever threaten to get into negative territory. So deflation was never a real challenge over the past decade. But the thing that jumps out of the chart as well is that in the last year, core CPE inflation has jumped up very significantly, and it's currently 3.6%, having been at a range of 1% to 2%. And this is the Fed's preferred measure, core CPE inflation. If you look at broader measures of, of inflation, consumer price inflation, then you see very similar behavior 
in the US, the UK and the Eurozone, which is inflation was more volatile than the core measure, but it's been under control for a long time until the past year when in all three areas, the rate of CPI inflation has jumped up. So the, the real question that we need to tackle is when the transitory factors have played out, to what level will core inflation return? And I suppose the main point I want to make today is that I think the real risk of inflation in the medium term doesn't come from the observation that we've seen prices rise so far, but it comes from the behavior and the statements of central banks. In other words, I do think that central banks have become a little too complacent. And I think there are three reasons to worry about the position that central banks have taken. The first one is that I think they have, by and large, in terms of the language they've used, somewhat misinterpreted the current position that we face today. COVID-19 isn't a typical business cycle. And in particular, both aggregate demand and potential supply fell and rose together. The estimates in the UK that I've seen show that when GDP fell by 20% in the early part of 2020, the estimate by the Central Bank and the Office of Budget Responsibility was that potential supply in aggregate fell by almost the same amount. They have not estimated any significant large output gap. And I think the, the big challenge is that when we are looking at a normal business cycle, monetary easing is a sensible response when demand falls sharply, but potential supply doesn't, which is what we think happens in a normal business cycle. Then monetary stimulus is appropriate. But that doesn't seem to be a good description of what's happened over the last 18 months or so. So if there isn't a really big output gap, what is the argument for a large monetary stimulus? And in particular, quantitative easing has tended to become a policy of responding to any bad news, even if there isn't a really good analysis of what the nature of that news is. And when there is no bad news, those purchases are not reversed. So using QE as a response to any bad news ends up having a ratchet effect on the central bank balance sheet which just continues relative to GDP to rise. My second worry about what central banks are doing at present is that they seem to have an excessive faith in models and forecasts. Models and forecasts can be very helpful. They give useful insights. And it's very sensible that policy shouldn't try to offset temporary deviations of inflation from target. At the Bank of England, we consciously did not try to offset a quite significant deviation of inflation from target over a three-year period following the largest depreciation of sterling in the post-war period, because we felt that domestically generated inflation was not rising. So trying not to offset temporary deviations makes sense, but you need a narrative that explains why the nature of the shock that we're currently facing justifies a belief that in the medium term, the current inflationary impetus will have diminished. And I worry that central banks just have an exaggerated view about their ability to control inflation. You know, too much faith has been placed in a particular model of monetary policy. And I think it's that that has led to the temptation just to use the usual language about a normal business cycle, which has led them to somewhat misdiagnose the nature of the shock that we're facing now. Basically, the outcome, um, any macroeconomic outcome is tended to be seen as the model prediction plus a shock. And the model is assumed to be known with certainty and the shock we know nothing about and it's just a drawing from a stochastic distribution. I think this is dangerous because in many ways, the truth is the opposite. The model is a stylized view of how the economy works. We don't know a lot about how the economy works. We certainly don't know enough. We know something, but maybe not enough. 
But once the shocks occurred, actually, we know a great deal about it. And that's why in the COVID case, I argued that demand and supply were moving together. And I think the third reason why I'm worried about the behavior of central banks is that they seem to have excessive faith in forward guidance. And relying on forward guidance when you don't have the ability to forecast sufficiently accurately to anticipate the time path of an optimal policy is risky because either you then are forced to change policy and maybe lose credibility that way, or you're tempted to stick to what you promised or people interpreted as a promise of the, your policy path, uh, and then you fall behind the curve. Somehow we need to spend more attention on what's happening in the world rather than in terms of the model. So I think my conclusion here is that some, and, and perhaps indeed most of the rising core PCE inflation could turn out to be temporary, but we can't be sure. And there certainly isn't much evidence that the output gap justifies both the largest monetary stimulus and the largest fiscal stimulus in recent history. So I think the risks are clearly on the upside and from that point of view, it would make more sense for central banks to abandon forward guidance, not to tighten policy necessarily now, though I think there is a case for ending QE, but just to be ready and to give the impression that they will tighten monetary policy if the data appear to justify it, and they will do the opposite if the data go the other way. But by sticking to forward guidance and promising that interest rates won't rise for a long time, I think stimulates more of the concern about there is a risk to inflation than they need to. They could simply be ready to move in either direction and recognize that there is a risk to higher inflation. But sticking to a policy path of not moving interest rates for some while isn't really consistent with that. So, my concern is not that the data now should make us panic, but should make us recognize that there is a higher degree of inflation now than had been expected. That requires careful monitoring. But what we mustn't do is therefore to remain committed to easy monetary policy indefinitely, but to demonstrate that the central banks are ready to move in either direction. So my concern is about the behavior of central banks rather than the numbers that we've currently seen. Let me end there, Bill. Thank you very much, Mervyn. Let me turn now to uh, Paul Krugman. Paul? Okay. Um, I suspect that actually Mervyn and I are disagreeing less than I might have expected uh, to, but let but let let me uh, let me give you a somewhat different take. Um, uh, first of all, I think it's, it is important. I think Mervyn is kind of agreeing on this that there are there are two inflation stories out there. Uh, one of which is the one that actually they, you know Larry Summers famously started pushing some months ago, and um, uh, which is and it's to some extent I think what Mervyn is worried about now, which is that we are just doing too much stimulus. That between particularly in the US with the American Rescue Plan and easy money that we were just pouring too much onto the economy um, and that this will lead to medium term higher inflation. And I'll come back to that in, in, in a minute. The other one is the immediate thing, which is the, the fact that we are in fact seeing quite high um, consumer price inflation right now. Um, where I think it is important to, uh, I think to, to make a, to apply some substantial interpretation to the data is that I, I'm kind of upset that people are still treating core inflation numbers um, in, in the traditional way. I mean, there, the, the concept of core inflation is a very, very useful one. The idea that there's a distinction between prices like oil that fluctuate up and down all the time and prices like new cars or wages that are uh, set relatively infrequently and are subject to a lot of inertia. Uh, and so the, the platonic ideal of core inflation is um, it's inflation that is the stuff that's inertial 
as opposed to the stuff that is highly volatile. Um, the actual measure that we use of core inflation is a rough and ready, um, uh, you know, quick and dirty approximation to that distinction. It's uh, it's the it's the shadow on the wall of Plato's cave. It's the uh, it's the uh, uh, excluding food and energy, which worked very well historically. Was a very very good way of of quickly distinguishing between more permanent and, and transitory shocks, but not in the post pandemic environment. So we are in, in a situation now where the big drivers of inflation are things like used car prices and hotel rooms, which clearly are not inertial prices, clearly shouldn't be part of core inflation, uh, the, the ideal of core inflation, but happen to be in the measure that we currently use. And now the there's a problem in the, the uh, Biden administration, CEA has a measure of you know, both of core inflation excluding pandemic effective prices, which I, I think is a pretty good one, but there's, there's a problem. It doesn't have the long history of, of being used. But I, I, I don't think that we should pay, be especially concerned that core inflation as conventionally measured is looking high. This still looks very much like a transitory inflation shock, the stuff that we're seeing so far. Um, and by the way, I, one, I've been trying to push very recently uh, for not even trying to measure expected inflation, a lot of people trying to do that, um, even that's problematic because in a way expected inflation, um, the idea that there is a, an expected rate of inflation, you know, that's a fiction, a convenient fiction, a useful one, but it's not, it's not really how people behave. Uh, if, even economists who aren't obliged to produce forecasts don't actually have a number in their mind. There's how people behave. And we know that some of the measures, the consumer surveys of expected inflation actually basically measure the current price of gasoline. Right? They're not actually getting it at anything like that. Um, what I find useful is to look at how firms are behaving. And what we see right now is firms are, um, some of them are raising prices, but apologizing and saying, you know, we're just being forced to do this. Um, some of them are offering, I, th I think it's really interesting to see what's going on in the labor market, where a number of firms are offering hiring bonuses, trying very hard to recruit people because they do see labor shortages, but they are very reluctant to raise base wages. They don't want to lock in higher wages, which is saying that they do not expect persistent ongoing inflation. They don't expect that all their competitors be raising wages, and therefore it's okay to lock in a higher wage rate. So it looks to me as if uh, we are not actually seeing these shocks translating into uh, a, a rise in underlying inertial inflation. Not yet. Could, could happen, but it's not there in the evidence so far. About the overheating, yeah. Um, I mean, I would, I, I've, to some extent, I do worry that, that central banks have been talking easy, uh, easy money for the indefinite future a little too strongly. That they, that, but I don't actually think in practice they start to see serious evidence that inflation is taking off, that they will stick with it. And um, it, it'll be embarrassing, but I, do, I don't think we're gonna have an Arthur Burns scenario uh, where inflation is allowed to, to get out of control. And if it goes a bit above 2%, uh, we may wanna get to that question. I, that, I, I don't think that's something to be terribly concerned about, uh, but that is the issue. And one of the, the question is really, are we doing too much stimulus? which is still, it's not at all clear. I mean, the, yes, we are facing clearly some reduction in aggregate supply, but how much of that is itself transitory, uh, right? In how much, um, if we actually are going to get this pandemic truly under control and people feel safe about going back to work, uh, how much of labor force comes back? How many of the, of the um, things like the chip shortages and, uh, and uh, the uh, shipping container shortage, something I never thought I'd be worrying about, uh, are things that will resolve themselves. And there, there's pretty good reason to think that we will be not too far below the previously expected path of potential output by sometime next year. We don't know that, definitely. 
want to keep your eyes open. Uh, definitely don't want to say uh, we will keep uh, interest rates at uh, you know at, at zero, no matter what, uh, because we could be surprised. Life life comes with surprises, and it's certainly possible that we'll be getting some inflation. Um, but I think. Um, I, I don't think that's actually a, a prospect that worries me too much that that's going to happen. Um, and one thing that is really important to say here is yes, there is a risk that central banks uh, will underreact to the inflation threat and we'll see some overshooting. Uh, but there's also you know, a very strong risk of, uh, of overreacting and, uh, and tightening too soon. In fact, the history of the past you know, decade plus has been one of both fiscal and monetary authorities being far too quick to withdraw support, that we have paid what appears to be a large price in terms of un, underutilized capacity, uh, uh, unnecessary uh, unemployment, because we were too ready to believe that the economy was at capacity. And it's a balance of risk. There's, there's no such thing as, as a risk-free economic policy. Um, and at the moment, I still think those, I, I guess I would disagree. I think those risks are fairly evenly balanced now, that there is in fact still a substantial chance that we will tighten too soon. And I, we, we need to be, we need to tell central bankers, you know, keep your eyes open. Don't lock yourself into a policy position that may be, turn out to have been you know, rendered moot by events, but um, bear in mind, you know, uh, don't want to fight the last war, uh, but you don't want to forget the lessons of the last war either. And the, the lessons of the last war were that we tightened way too soon. End of story. Thank you, Paul. So let me ask you a question about that. It seems like to me that the Fed has changed their regime in response to the lessons yeah. of the last economic expansion. They moved to a 2% average inflation targeting regime. Yeah. So they basically have committed to let inflation go above 2% for some time. And they've operationalized that by saying that they're not going to even raise short-term rates until they've achieved 2% inflation, full employment, and expect inflation to be above 2% in the future. So uh, haven't they already made that adjustment that they fight, that they're now have a different regime in place to fight a potentially different war? Well, we th they say they have. I mean, how much how much these statements actually affect policy? And by the way, I mean, one of the questions uh, the audience doesn't know this, but that bill circulated in advance was, you know, is is the two percent inflation target too low, or at any rate, is it sacrosanct? And one of the you know the, the story of how two percent came to be the magic number is is a pretty strange story, and it's it, you know was based you know who 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 decreed that? And the answer basically is New Zealand. Uh, one of the few times, and uh, I think in human history, that New Zealand has has possibly done a great deal of damage to the world. Um, but the um, but more to the point, it the whole you know two percent as the as the as as the definition of price stability uh, came at a time. Actually, Mervin talks about believing too much in your models. Um, in the late 1990s, the models said that a two percent inflation rate was sufficient to ensure that we would almost never hit the zero lower bound. And you know that's kind of not how things worked out. So uh, whatever it was that we thought made two percent the right number turns out not to have been true. So I, I'm not. Yes, the Fed. Had, I mean, I, but I think it's to the Fed's credit that they have in fact changed the regime some. Whether they've changed it too much or enough is something we'll find out probably in the next couple of years. Let me ask that same question for you, Mervin, uh, in terms of how the Fed's operationalized their long-term monetary policy framework. I think everyone accepts that moving to 2% average inflation targeting makes some sense because you want to keep inflation expectations. Well yeah, so I, I think this is being too clever by half. And I think if you listen to what Paul said, I suppose you imagine Paul setting policy. Paul's not going to sit there and say, you know what? I think we're going to let the inflation run at 2.9% for the next 15 months then bring it back down to 2%. This is a kind of... Um, hubristic view about how easy it is to control inflation. And the most important thing I think that Paul said, where I strongly agree with him, is that when he was analyzing what was going on with inflation now, he was asking the question, what is going on in the economy? What, what is the nature of the shock that's hit the economy? And he used that analysis of the pandemic to 
try to understand why it is that some prices may be going up now, but won't go on going up forever. Um, and that is the crucial essence of setting policy. What the big mistake is to have this abstract framework in which you kid yourself that because you appear to have been between one and 2% for a long while, which is no disaster given the history of inflation in any of our countries, that somehow you then need to change the framework that says, you know, we, we're deliberately going to try to allow inflation to go above target to compensate for an undershoot. That, I think, requires a degree of knowledge of how the economy behaves that we simply don't have. And it would be better to use the argument that Paul used, which is to say, look, inflation, okay, inflation is above 2% now, but there are some good reasons for that, given the nature of the shock that's hit the economy. And there are good reasons for thinking that it won't continue at that rate. Now, we will stand ready to take action if we see evidence that it is persisting above that rate, um, but it may fall below again, and we may need to move in the opposite direction. Being ready to respond to the data is a lot more sensible than believing in either a strategy that's too clever by half or uh, giving forward guidance, which commits you in some sense to following a path that events may decree that you don't want to follow in either direction. Let me ask a question about uh, uh, data. So we have this debate about inflation, how tr transitory or persistent it's likely to be economic data is going to come in, what data do you think is the most important that we should be focusing on to determine whether the inflation problem turns out to be transitory or persistent? The inflation data itself, what's happening in the U.S. labor market, what's happening to inflation expectations, what things do you think we should pay most attention to? Let me ask you that. Start with Mervyn on that one. So at one level, you need to look at all the numbers and data and put together a coherent narrative about what's going on. But if you were to say, you know, which are the key numbers to look at, then I think labor costs are the key thing. And you know, if, if Paul's right in saying that the increase in labor costs we see is being uh, steered towards signing on fees rather than an increase in the base wage, that provides more comfort that this will not persist into a medium term problem. But I think wage costs are the thing which you know, one might want to focus on more than other things. You know, if I can say that it, 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 the pandemic has uh, really made stuff even harder to uh, it, 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 the, the ability, our ability to interpret data has been drastically degraded because even things you would think that looking at something like average hourly wages would be a you know, that, that sounds like a pretty core measure, except we know that it's been wildly distorted by composition effects because the um, the initial layoffs fell so heavily on, on low wage workers. And so it's a little tricky. I mean, um, I know that uh, Powell um, has been citing the uh, Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which is, is, uh, you know, is a measure, but we don't really know how, how good it is. Um, I actually am kind of a believer, I hate to say this, in the, um, um, in the touchy-feely stuff. I mean, I, I'm actually seriously reading the Beige Book these days because I really want to know, you know what are people saying? Uh, yep. Reading the business press, what are, what are people saying? Because in some ways, our all of our numbers are being uh, have a, a lot more noise in them because of the pandemic situation. And one way to get a sense of what's happening is, you know, talk to people. Uh, huge. I mean, uh, uh, if people haven't read, I mean, the, the I still think one of the greatest works of labor economics of the past uh, several decades was Truman Bewley's uh, Why Don't Wages Fall in Recessions, where he had the completely novel idea of going out and asking companies why they don't cut wages. You know, I think, I think talking to people is probably one of the best things we can do right now to figure out what's happening. And I think that one of the contributions that Alan Greenspan made to the discussion of policy was to encourage people to look had a lot of data and to go and talk to companies and try and find out what was actually going on. I mean, at the Bank of England, we put a lot of effort into using our network of regional agents to talk to you know, thousands of businesses across the country. And every month we get reports back. And this was not a substitute for looking at the official data, but it was a complement to it. And it did enable us to raise questions about 
are the official data misleading us? Are we missing something yeah. by taking the official data at face value? And I think this is very much what policy needs to be about. And, and that's why I do think that the unfortunate result of focusing on forward guidance has been to diminish the emphasis on these kinds of data and to switch it to a view that we have a path of policy that we, you know, we won't be dislodged from this path easily. And I think it is better not to have that it's better to look at the numbers and eat, let the narrative evolve from what you think is going on. Oh, and if I can say something, the one, one thing I think that's probably inherent in, the, um, in, in, in being a central banker is that you, you think of forward guidance is, to a large extent, I guess you could think of it as being aimed at the bond market in your, in your, or financial markets. Yeah. But in some ways, the audience that we really need to reach here on policy that is wage and price setters. Yep. And that, that's not the same. It's not clear to me that even at Fortune 500 companies, there are people seriously saying, okay, when I try to think about the wage, wage offers we should be making this year, let's, let's parse what, what Jay Powell said in his latest speech. I don't think that that's, I, I think that there, the, the, you know, so basically it's not clear to me how much uh, forward guidance is actually mattering for the actual setting of wages and prices. I could be wrong, but it, it does not, I, you know, we, we like to imagine that, that people are hanging on, on, on everything that central bankers say, but the, the people who matter may not be. I think, you're, I think Paul's right. There's a, that's a number of people that actually pay very, very close attention to central bankers is probably, you know, at most 1% of the population. That's a, problem. Well, that's a pretty good reason for not having a too sophisticated framework that you spend your time speaking to yourself. Let me ask you a question about both of you, a question about the U.S. labor market, because there is a really interesting conundrum right now in the U.S. labor market. On one hand, we're about six million jobs short of where we were in February 2020 at the start of the pandemic in the United States. On the other hand, we have a record number of, of, of job openings and businesses report in the beige book that they're having trouble finding workers. So how do we how do we reconcile those two things? Because uh, it seems to me like it's pretty important how tight is the U.S. labor market in terms of its implications for monetary policy. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it, that that is a one of my biggest uncertainties is is how many of people are in fact how much of this is transitory, how much of this is people who, um, you know, probably. It, it's, we thought some people, you know, obviously were claiming it was unemployment benefits that were doing it, uh, but that, um, at least for what it's worth, the early indications don't uh, on the data don't support that, um, and also the fact that the labor is not just a U.S. phenomenon. U.K. is reporting, which had a very very different, nothing like this. You know, the the U.K.'s way of dealing with the labor market effects of the pandemic was very different from ours, and yet the same stories. Of, of difficulty in hiring are, are, are prevalent there. Um, it looks as if a lot of people, um, having been forced out of their jobs, uh, came to realize how much they had hated those jobs and don't want to go back. Now, whether they can maintain that position, whether they have the financial resources or are able to make alternative arrangements um, is something that is we don't know. You kind of think that the spur of economic necessity will eventually force people back. We don't know that for sure. And uh, particularly, um, I guess this was before we, <laughs> before we formally began this thing, we were talking uh, quite a few people fairly close to retirement age probably just ain't coming back. And uh, so there, there's a significant, that's, that's, that's a, a fairly significant number of people. But yeah, and um, I was telling you, right? The, I, I have, have almost complete control over what the headlines on my New York Times columns read, but I was not allowed to use the headline, you can take this job and shove it. But that's what I think a lot of people are, in fact, thinking. So, as Paul says, we, we, we have a similar phenomenon in the UK, but it certainly isn't caused by the explanation that Paul described, because although in the US unemployment rose very sharply and then came down again quite sharply, Unemployment barely rose in the UK because of the furlough schemes. So people weren't forced out of their jobs. I think the big thing is that it, this is not a moment to focus on aggregate GDP. 
that the differences between different sectors in the economy are of fundamental importance here. And some sectors saw closure of output, even if in the UK we maintained employment, other sectors didn't. And I think there's gonna be a significant reallocation of resources from one part of the economy to another. We don't know how big or over what time horizon, but I think the, the circumstances suggest to me that we would expect a reallocation of resources with some parts of the economy wanting to expand and finding it difficult to obtain labor and other parts of the economy still facing contraction. And I think the, the, the only way to understand what's going on in terms of both jobs and vacancies, I think, is in terms of a disaggregated view of what is happening in the economy. Let me turn back to the Fed and quantitative easing. So the Fed is still buying $80 billion of treasuries a month and 40 billion of agency mortgage-backed securities a month, even as we've gotten the unemployment rate down to 5.2%. And we expect the economy to recover strongly over the next year, especially if we get the Delta variant under control. What's your assessment of quantitative easing at this stage? Do you think it's going on too strong for too long or do you think it's appropriate? Do you think it's creating financial asset bubbles? How do you uh, evaluate it? Mervyn, maybe you can start on that. So I think that quantitative easing was fairly effective in 2009, 2010, but like any monetary policy measure, it's, by, it's in its essence a kind of counter cyclical policy instrument. And if you're in a position where growth is weak for a long time, then it's effectiveness declines. So I find it hard to see the impact of QE in the last year is on the same scale as the impact of QE after the financial crisis. And as I argued before, you know, I'm not sure that the conditions that would normally justify significant monetary easing applied last year. After all, the initial justification for it was not that demand had fallen relative to potential supply, but that there were dislocations in the US Treasury market and indeed in a wider set of financial markets. I don't think that's surprising given if you suddenly learn there's a global pandemic, you'd think the price discovery process would become a lot more difficult and there'd be a lot of volatility for a short period. But those problems in the treasury market did go away, but the measures taken to support it were not then removed. And indeed people doubled down on QE so I, I worry that QE has become something that people do whenever something bad happens, uh, irrespective of a proper analysis of whether or not there is a genuine case for monetary stimulus. So I, I think that we may be exaggerating the importance of QE, but by the same token, the size of the central bank balance sheet is now so large. That in itself isn't an issue, but what is more of an issue, I think, is that we have now increased the holdings of commercial banks with the central bank to a level that has gone even beyond my aspirations in terms of trying to ensure an adequate um, requirement on holding liquid assets by the commercial banking system. And I think it's inevitable, therefore, that we'll see some sort of withdrawal from it. But what I find peculiar is the attention that financial markets are paying to the precise speed of tapering uh, asset purchases. It's not as if they're gonna stop asset purchases, it's just the speed of the taper. Again, this is fine tuning, which doesn't seem to me to be easy to calibrate. Um, I'm kind of fanatically indifferent to the whole QE question. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I agree that I don't think it, I, I, don't, I have not been convinced that it did very much after the early stages of the financial crisis when it was, when, when markets were dysfunctional. And again, briefly, basically March of 2020, when it was critical in keeping the markets from imploding. Um, and it's not clear to me how much good it's done, but it's also, I'm finding it hard to find much argument that does a great deal of harm either. So it's become something where it's sort of symbolic value. And I think central banks are kind of afraid to stop because people might react to it, but they, in terms of any concrete impact on the markets beyond the signaling effect, it's really just nothing much there. I mean, I, 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 
in, in the course of a normal week, I don't think about QE at all, because I don't think it's actually an important factor in what's going on. Well, it seems to have been associated with a very dramatic rise in financial asset prices. Uh, and there's a question of whether the Fed should be, you know, we're, we've been talking about price inflation for goods and services. I guess another related question is, should the Fed be worried about the price inflation of, you know, the stock market and the bond market? Should that end I, I have a view on that, which is that it's not about QE. That it's a, it's that a lot of financial prices. I mean, a lot of, certainly a lot of corporate profits are basically rents of some kind rather than a return on capital. And since we seem to have, you know, we're still basically very much a secular stagnation world with apparent uh, perceived returns on actual invest, uh, investment very low. Of course, you bid up the prices of of streams of income. I I just don't. I think those crazy financial prices are basically saying that we're a world that's awash in savings with nowhere to go. I'm gonna now open it up to, to the audience for questions that were submitted through the chat or the Q&A. Uh, the first question comes from uh, Catherine Mann who asked Mervyn uh, what, the question of how much should central banks take into consideration what's happening in financial asset markets in terms of setting uh, monetary policy or should they just be focused on the real economy? Well, I think they should not incorporate asset prices into a target measure for inflation. But what is happening to asset prices is bound to affect their judgment about the path which the economy will follow, and hence the implications for both inflation and activity. So it certainly matters, but I don't think it's something that one would want to target. And I think, as Paul said, the, the main reason for the very high level of asset prices relative to incomes is the very low level of long-term real interest rates. And that doesn't show much sign of shifting at present, but that's what's led to the very high level of asset prices. Um, now, I think my worry would be here that at some point there will be an adjustment in the economy which will lead to those real interest rates rising. I don't think they are going to be there forever. And therefore, at some point, we should expect to see a reduction in the ratio of asset prices to income. That could come either through a fall in the absolute level of asset prices or through a rise in the rate of growth of incomes, inflation, or some mixture of the two. Um, so I worry about the sustainability of long-term real interest rates. It's not the asset prices as such that is the concern, it's the very low level of long-term real rates. You know, you're not, so neither of you are worried about the stock market being at an all-time high at a time that the economic outlook is you know, very uncertain. It's not a concern. Well, I mean, I'm concerned in the sense that I'm not sure that it's sustainable. And at some point, real rates will start to rise. And what I worry about is that monetary policy is not the right policy instrument to deal with the position we're in, that it will need some real adjustments in the, our own and the global economy to get back to a point where real rates will indeed be higher. So, uh, so we have a number of questions about fiscal policy. So we've been talking about inflation and monetary policy, but we also have a pretty big change in regime in terms of how we think about fiscal policy in the United States and the rest of the world, there, there seems to be a lot more room for fiscal policy than there was in the past. How should the Fed take that into consideration and how, do, how should we all take that into consideration in terms of how we think about uh, inflation risk? Oh, um, yeah, I really, I'm, I'm very much uh, US centric here, so I don't have a, uh, I haven't, done much homework on the rest. I mean, the US had a huge you know, uh, additional fiscal stimulus uh, early this year. Um, and the numbers look very large. And um, if there, it, was not, it was not silly to be worried that that might be too much. Um, uh, although they, once you start to look at it, I think it, it it, it's probably a very low multiplier fiscal expansion. Um, a large part of it was aid to state and local governments who turn out to actually not be 
particularly cash constrained for the most part and are actually going to spend it down very slowly. A lot of it was grants of money to people who were not liquidity constrained and are going to treat it more like an increase in wealth than like a, a flow of income. And so it, it's probably not that big a deal. And, and, um, and it's in the rearview mirror now. It's, it, it, there may be some lag effects, but I think that was not such a big deal. And then, you know, we're going to find out whether we get another big U.S. spending package. But this is where the, you know, $3.5 trillion dollars uh, I can't do my Dr. Evil imitation, but the, uh, um, it's, first of all, it's over 10 years. Secondly, it's going to be, it's not going to be 3.5 trillion in the end, and it's going to be to a significant extent uh, paid for so that the amount of fiscal stimulus, I mean, e even in the um, Biden administration wish list version of it, the, the max uh, deficit impact of their plans was going to be about a little over 1% of GDP. So it's really not a whole lot of fiscal stimulus. So although the numbers sound very big, I think in the end, and, and anything that does happen, as, as uh, I was delighted to see Mervyn uh, focusing from, on monetary policy from the beginning, there's nothing, there's nothing in the fiscal pipeline that couldn't be offset if the Fed is prepared to be vigilant. What do you think about the change in the fiscal orthodoxy? Um, amazing that it, that it took so long, but yeah, I mean, when when Olivier Blanchard, who is the uh, the most sensible person in, on on the planet, says basically we don't need to worry about debt, I think that's a uh, that that is a a moment of major transition. Reverend, do you have any comments on the fiscal? Well, when, when you say we don't need to worry about debt, that's true of some governments and some yeah. people. It's not true at all. And I think that's where my worries would, would be. I think in terms of Europe, um, there will not be the same degree of fiscal stimulus. Paul's explained why it's not that large in the US. It's even less, I think, elsewhere. Um, there will be a lot more government spending, I think, after COVID, because people can see that the requirements to make a range of different parts of our economy more resilient require more public expenditure. But in the euro area, they're very slow to change the degree of fiscal spending. There's a great deal of caution there. And in the UK, in the last 48 hours, we've had the biggest tax increase announced in 50 years to pay for social care and the National Health Service. Now, there's a good argument, I think, for demonstrating that if you're going to spend more on the health service, it automatically raises a certain contribution. Um, but nevertheless, it, relative to where we were, it's a significant uh, fiscal tightening. Uh, at a, at a, I mean, it won't come in immediately, but it's certainly, it's there. And it's led in the space of 24 hours to a dramatic collapse in the popularity of the government in the opinion polls. So it's not clear there's a lot of support for raising raising taxes, even though there's obviously support for spending more. So I don't think the issues else outside the US will be as big. And Paul has argued in the US, they're not that big anyway. Thank you. So here we have an interesting question about uh, transitory inflation. So let's imagine that transitory inflation lasts longer than we anticipate. Isn't there a risk that a long period of transitory inflation could lead to a rise in inflation expectations, which in turn could make the transitory inflation more persistent? Is that something that we should be worried about? Well, there is, and that's the risk. Uh, it doesn't mean to say we know what's going to happen. We don't. But I think that's why I keep saying what central banks need to do is to spend all their effort not talking about forward guidance, but spend more of their time doing what Paul was doing earlier, which is to tell a story about what is actually happening to inflation, why you believe that some of this will be transitory in the short run, why some may persist a bit longer, but this is what we're going to look at to monitor that, and tell a credible story so that businesses and others interested in it can say, yeah, these guys are not complacent. They've told a good story about why they're not tightening immediately or if their story isn't credible and they are coming up with excuses all the time to allow inflation to go above target then they'll lose credibility and they may fall behind the curve but I think to be credible here 
is really about telling a story about what's going on in the economy that, that, that links to what people see and feel for themselves. It sounds plausible, sounds sensible. It's not telling some abstract story about based on four guidance. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I, I think what, this is where a case we're trying to be realistic. Um, I mean, there, there's no cutoff date that says, you know, a sell by date at which inflation ceases to be transitory. And it, it, you can have transitory inflation that lasts more than a year if, if that's, if, if there are factors that will go away predictably, but where it takes a while. Um, there is, I think, I, I think we can probably fault some of the players in the system for being too complacent about how quickly it goes down. Um, and oddly, there's a the, the White House is 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 more, I'd say, realistic about how long transitory inflation will per, persist than the Fed is at this point. It's a, it a, you know, who, who, and it, we just you know you really need this is a really weird situation. Who knew that that chip shortages and container shortages could be so sustained. Those are the kinds of things that should not, in the end, raise the underlying inflation rate, but they could last well into next year. And they could raise wages and then could raise inflation expectations. I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, you know, the idea that workers are going to demand wage increases to offset inflation, uh, when was the last time you saw workers demand anything successfully in any Anglo-Saxon country? <laughs> I'm going to ask a question that was uh, submitted before we, we, we got came on the air from uh, Karen and Conway. Um, he's pretty nervous about inflation. He said, why is it, isn't this setting up to be a 1977-81 type of systemic inflation period? And he cites a number of parallels, chronic budget deficits. Um, then we went off the gold standard, we had, and now we have rise of digital currencies. Uh, then we had price controls. Now we have the Fed using its uh, uh, balance sheet in a very aggressive way. You know, what odds would you put of the Fed just missing it badly and having trouble putting the genie back in the bottle? Is it 1% risk? Is it 10% risk? Is it something we should be worried about? Well, I don't know, and I don't think it helps to put a percentage number on it because this is a one-off unique position that we're in now. And clearly, you could imagine circumstances in which a combination of political pressure and central bank inaction did lead to a gradual pickup of inflation. I mean, remember the 1970s, the very high inflation didn't suddenly come out of nothing. It was a period in which inflation gradually picked up. And I think there were intellectual failures to then to understand what was going on, which you know, I think there are fewer of now, other than this belief that we understand the model. But uh, this is just why Watching, waiting, monitoring, and taking action when you think it's needed is the most important thing. And it's why I, my biggest worry is that central banks, if they take their eye off the ball, it's because they'll be thinking about other things altogether, whether it's inequality, dealing with the unemployment of particular groups, or climate change. They ought to be focusing single-mindedly on trying to analyze what is happening to inflation and talking about it and explaining to people why they don't think that higher chip prices, for example, is going to mean the need for a, a, an urgent monetary tightening. But rather than say now, what is the right thing to do? I think it's a change in the stance and attitude of what central banks are focusing on. I wanna come back. There's another question about uh, the Fed's inflation target. Uh, the question is, uh, when a few years of 4% inflation be a good idea to help facilitate moving uh, you know, supply to, to areas where the, where demand is excessive and vice versa. So we help the economy adjust to the shock of the pandemic, help shrink the burden of the debt. Um, and we do know how to keep it from, you know, going ever upward. Should, should, should the inflation target be raised from 2%? So I'm going to say no to that, but I want to go back to something Paul said earlier. Paul said, if you have a good reason for allowing inflation to go above target and you believe that it will come back, in the medium term, then you can allow it to rise. Between 2010 and 2013 at the Bank of England, we had seen such a large depreciation of sterling that we knew there was going to be a change in the relative price of traded and non-traded goods. We didn't want to force prices of non-traded goods down, uh, but we were prepared to accept 
we thought this would mean a change in the aggregate price level of you know, 10 to 12% over three to four years. So we accepted that inflation could be you know, three to 4% above target uh, for quite a long period of three years. And we did that. And people said, well, you know, why don't you take action? Because inflation's above target. And I would say, well, do you want a deeper recession? It's bad enough as it is. You want an even deeper one? We think there are good reasons for saying that because wage costs are not rising at all, that inflation will come back once this impact of exchange rates pass through. And that's exactly what happened. So if you've got a good story and a good narrative, then there are circumstances in which, you know, if we had 5% inflation uh, for a few years, that is a good thing because you're not creating unnecessary damage to the real economy. But whether it is a good thing is not something you can give a yes or no answer to. It depends entirely on the circumstances that you're facing. Okay, I have, if I had a time machine and could go back and somehow weigh in on at the time when the orthodoxy of 2% inflation was established, um, I would have argued, knowing what we know now, that that was too low, that 4% would have been a, a, a better target. And we actually had, uh, I remember 4% inflation, late 80s was 4% inflation, and it was not terrible. You know, it, it was not, that wasn't high enough to really make a, cause a lot of difficulties, and it would have given us a lot more policy room. Now, the, the legitimate argument is, can we safely manage transitioning to a higher inflation rate, uh, or would things spin out of control? And I have to admit that I'm, I'm I think it would probably be a, a good thing if we could do it, and, uh, but but I, I can see the problem. It's a little bit like the question of, should you join the Euro versus should you exit the Euro? Uh, if the question is, you know, should Britain join the Euro? Absolutely not. Should uh, Italy exit the Euro? Well, that's a very different question. And so the, but, but there's certainly, if, if we could somehow sneak in several years of 4% inflation without people realizing that that was a deliberate policy, it might well be a good thing. There's a question for Mervyn. Uh, you said central banks should end forward guidance now. So how would you evaluate the rec recent communications from the Fed and the ECB? What, what, should, what should the statements look like uh, relative to what they're actually doing? Well, I think we should go back to the good old days before forward guidance in which people say, this is what we think is happening in the economy. You get your credibility through having a well thought through narrative backed up by data and empirical evidence. And you update the narrative every, say, three months. So this is what we've learned over, over the last three months. This is what we think the position is now. But what you don't do is to say, we know what's going to happen in the future. And therefore, this is our policy path. Because people, even if you, even if you restrict your attention just to participants in financial markets, they won't necessarily agree with the central bank view of what is going to happen to the economy in the future. And so it's very important to distinguish between the central bank reaction function on the one hand, where you don't want there to be any confusion, and the central bank view of what will happen in the future, where it's perfectly reasonable for other people to disagree with that. And these two things need to be separated, and forward guidance confuses, conflates the two. So, um, you know, that, that's, I, I just think the communications have been focusing on the wrong thing. You're worried about the central bank's credibility. Hard to forecast, especially in this uncertain world. And if you make forecasts and you emphasize those forecasts, you're going to be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one, of the lessons, one of the lessons I learned was it's, it's very important for policymakers to say openly, I don't know, and not to be ashamed of that. And when you do it for the first time, people in Congress or Parliament shout back, you know, what do you mean you don't know? It's your job to know. And the answer is, it's not my job to know an unknowable future. It's my job to respond to what we do know today and to make assessments of risks. But it's not my job to pretend that we know something that we can't know today. And that's especially true in the current situation because we've never gone through a downturn like this and subsequent recovery. We don't have a lot of experience with the pandemics and, 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 their, and their medium and long-term implications for the economy. I think we're gonna have to wrap it up uh, any final thoughts, uh, Paul or Mervyn? Well, I think my only 
final thought would be that I, I, I don't share Paul's view that it would be a good idea to aim for 4%. And I think if we inadvertently hit 4% while the target was still two, the problem would be that credibility would be damaged in the absence of good explanation of why we allowed it to go to four. There may be circumstances when that's sensible, but then central banks should be open about it and defend it. Um, and I say, say you know, we don't really know what will happen to inflation in future, but I do think there is a risk that central banks have fallen behind the curve and they don't seem to be reacting to that risk in as quite a responsive way as I would wish. There has been a change in the last couple of months with central banks talking more now about tapering QE and easing the rate of asset purchases and in some cases ending them. Um, but this is fine tuning and I think it'd be better to, to go further and to focus attention on interest rates and on the risks and not to move now, but to explain what the risks are and what data will be relevant to assessing those risks as time unfolds so that people can see that the central bank is responding in an intelligent way. Paul? Yes, I mean, signaling that the central bank is intelligent and responsive does sound like a good idea. Maybe, uh, maybe we should have Jay Powell um, you know, start quoting Yogi Berra. Uh, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And, um, and, uh, and, and say that that is a fundamental principle of Fed policy. That much, that much I think we can agree. And I don't, I don't think the risks are, of, of inflation running out of control are especially high. I think that, that they're, in the end, it's, it's just not very likely to happen, but um, it wouldn't hurt for the central bank to be kind of open about, about saying that you know, we, we, we acknowledge this is a possibility. We don't think it's large, but we do acknowledge that it's a possibility and we won't let it happen. I think that's what Jay Powell was doing a little bit in his Jackson Hole speech, yeah. because he basically talked a lot about inflation to, to sort of show that they've really thought about it uh, yeah. to a great degree. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, and thank you, Mervyn. Uh, great insights on uh, inflation risk. I think everybody probably feels a little bit better, because uh, I think the general sense of the conversation was, you know, it's mostly got it under control, and, and most of the inflation pressures that we're seeing are, in fact, likely to prove transitory. Let me turn it over now to Liana. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you, especially to, to Mervyn and Paul and to, and to Bill for being our moderator today. Uh, before we go, I just want to remind you of some future events. Uh, the next event we have is our, is our symposium, October 1st and 2nd. Very related uh, to the talk today, uh, obviously the labor market, uh, what does the Delta variant mean for um, employment, work from home? How will, will some of the uh, transformations that we've seen during COVID stick around? Like will work from home be something that, that remains? Uh, these are all uh, questions that we're gonna be tackling in our symposium October 1st and 2nd on post-pandemic uh, labor market. Um, for the rest of our events this fall, um, I invite you to look at our website. We have another roundtable on a cryptocurrency coming up in November, as well as some uh, book talks. So um, have a lovely start to your weekend. Thank you again uh, to everyone that came out and to especially those in the roundtable. And we will see you hopefully at our next event.